Hello, everybody, and welcome to the weekly Locked On Big 12 Roundtable. Tonight, questions from you all. It was Memorial Day weekend, so we moved our Monday mailbag to Tuesday. We'll take your questions tonight and debate the biggest questions you all have for us. That's coming up on the show. You are Locked On Baylor, your daily podcast on the Baylor Bears, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello, everybody. I am Josh Neighbors, the host of Locked On Big 12. If you're watching on YouTube, to my right, it is John Williams, the host of Locked On Sooners. Below him, it is Jake Hatch. He is the host of Locked On Cougars. And to his left, below me, it is Drake Toll. He is the host of Locked On Baylor, Locked On Bears. I always forget. It's Locked On Baylor, right? Yeah, there was a thing in Chicago, something, something, before Baylor happened. So we're Locked well, On Baylor. Well, we never know this because one Jake Hatch had to deal with the old cease and desist. From the from the Brigham Young Cougars for Your his story. podcast name. We were, so we were locked on BYU for all of about five episodes, and then we quickly no. changed to locked on Cougars. So that is wow. why I'm always skeptical. That's why I always uh, I, I don't know about this stuff. We we have questions we're gonna get to tonight. First thing though, we, we did get a question about baseball. I want to touch on this real fast. Guys, the Big 12 did not get get much respect when it came to the seating. Uh the question we got was from Brian Caper saying, How the heck did the back to back champs not host this year? with a frowny face emoji. I believe he's referring to the TCU Horn Frogs, who, um, you know, they kind of backed their way into the Big 12 title, to be honest. Um, You're welcome. And I, yeah, <laughs> the Oklahoma Sooners. But, you know, John, I have to say this, like, them not hosting and OU not hosting was really surprising. Mm-hmm. The big problem is, though, we were getting the host sites before Oklahoma had even played in the Big 12 championship game. And I know it's one game, but they smoked Texas and it looked like the best team really for the last three weeks of the season. John, they should be hosts. I mean, this is this is not sour grapes. They should be hosting. Yeah, it is a bit of a surprise that neither the regular season champion or the tournament champion is getting the host, one of the the regionals. The only thing I can really point to is the the fact that maybe UT and OSU have had much longer runs of baseball success and maybe considered more baseball hotbeds. I don't know. That's really all I can really point to is maybe they're going to have better facilities, better stadiums set up to host a regional. But, yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't make any sense. You know, Oklahoma won five straight series to close the season, including three on the road. They swept Kansas. They took two or three from Texas Tech, two or three from TCU, and had a chance to get a share of the Big 12 title on the last day of the season before dropping that, that final game to Texas Tech. But – yeah, I mean, they played great in the tournament. They were up 8-1 to one when the announcements were coming out about the regionals, right. which is two things that are baffling about that. That one, that the NCAA would come out with the regionals while there's still championships getting played. And two, that the Big 12 wouldn't think that, oh, maybe they're going to announce re- the regionals before our game finishes. Maybe we should consider moving Well, the problem up. is the TV decides that, though, because, like, the Pac-12, they played their conference title game at – Nine o'clock Eastern time, I believe, Yeah, on, on Sunday night, which is – they have to figure this out. And I get that Oklahoma's RPI was only like 20 and they were 24 going in, but we got to consider a little bit of context when these decisions are getting made. Yes, the RPI matters. Yes, they had some bad losses at times, but they also had some big wins. And they – I mean, they took one in Stillwater from Oklahoma State. They were close in the other couple games. This is a team that should have been hosting, and either one of them or TCU should have gotten a hosting opportunity. The fact that neither did is testament to a flaw in the system. Yeah, the Big 12 did not get very good looks this year. Drake, bad, oh. sad news out of Baylor. Steve Rodriguez, and you you said he had to go, and others were saying it. It seems like you know this was, this was not the way people wanted to see it. And I know our friend Stephen Simcox is not here. It feels very much Jer- Gary Patterson, TCU. It's like, mm. look, we didn't want it to end this way, but it had to for Steve Rodriguez and Baylor. Yeah, we're like on the opposite end of the spectrum as John. Like John is like, yo, we should have gotten a host site. Baylor's like, look, man, I, I don't even know what to do with baseball right now. Um, right. You, you know, obviously it's a, it's a hairy situation. You're looking at a team that went 26 and 28 last year, and oddly enough, there are a lot of Baylor fans who are pretty argumentative about this one and think that Rodriguez needed a longer leash because he got a tough shake in a couple of his seasons, and a lot of his players got hurt. But there's also the flip side of that coin when you have a ton of pitching injuries. At some point, you got to look at technique. I mean, what what's your pitching coach really settling in with his guys there are a lot of questions there and telling you there were 15 to 20 players a source told us that had threatened the transfer portal if Rodriguez was kept in Waco and if you lose say even the low end 15 of your guys from your roster you're just gutted your, your program's oh gutted God. so 
it's the weird situation now with the prevalence of the transfer portal that if these teams really want to throw a mutiny, they can. The players can get the coach fired whenever they want to, which he didn't get fired. He, air quotes for the people listening at home, stepped down, but he was told to step down for sure. And in the end, you need a baseball coach that's from Texas. If you're a Texas school, anybody disagree? Okay, sweet. You need a Texas guy. He was a California guy. It didn't work out. Small ball doesn't play well in Central Texas. So hello, Mitch Thompson. Thank you. Good night. Um, Jake, I will ask you this, you know, you guys, you all have the one of the most beautiful parks in all mm. of America when it comes to college baseball. What it seems like you don't have quite yet and you're going to need when you're going to go to a conference with a bunch of teams from Texas is going to be a team. Now, look, that's not a team that, I, I, you know, that's it, awful. It's missed the, missed the NCAA turn of the bunch. They made it last in 2017, but... Um, you know, they lose their coach, Mike Littlewood, this year, and now Trent Pratt. The interim actually had a, you know, did a pretty decent job, but uh, the future of BYU baseball, you know, they, they're going to need a little bit of a some bumping up, some, some upping the quality of play as they head to the uh, the Big 12. Yeah, the biggest thing is pitching's at a premium in college baseball. We all know yeah. that. And B- BYU, they are, they're a cold-weather school that plays at altitude. So you've got to have good pitching, and they know that. I had a conversation uh, with uh, Mike Littlewood going into the season in February, and he talked about the fact that they got ready to play in the Big 12. He said that we're going to need to continue to develop our pitching depth overall, the overall talent base and just the overall depth of their bullpen. And I thought their pitching actually was pretty good this year for BYU. They kind of flamed out in the West Coast Conference Tournament despite making a very, very good run towards making that postseason tournament. So, yeah, th- it's going to be interesting to see if Trent Pratt does get elevated to being the permanent replacement for Littlewood after he's been a longtime assistant for Mike. But some interesting times ahead for BYU baseball. They're going into a whole new realm for them because they have never played this level of baseball as they go into the Big 12. Uh, and to that, you know, I know we don't always talk about baseball on here, but it's worth mentioning as we as we hit that time. Also, I have to mention three, three Big 12 programs are in the college world, Women's College World Series for softball, Oklahoma, Oklahoma State, and also Texas. And we always mention this for OU, but it needs to be mentioned for Oklahoma State. Another year where Kenny G, Kenny Gajewski's group does not have to leave the state of Oklahoma as well, because we always mention that for OU, right? Yeah, it's, Drake, you got something on softball you want to mention? Dude, look, guess who the Baylor softball PA guy is? Uh-huh. Is it you? Uh-huh. Is it you? Look, guys, you don't, you don't have to clap for those listening on, on no. the podcast. You guys I, had no I had no idea um, we had a broadcasting right. legend with yeah, us. Yeah, you got a softball how guy they, on here how right they, now. How do they do this year? You're swinging right up my alley. Hello. How do they do this year? Uh, how do they do? How did who do? Baylor. Oh, winners of the NIT. Hello. I did see yeah. That. I yeah. Did you see guys were you guys were all looking elsewhere. We were sneakily winning tournaments. That's right. Only two teams in their season with a win. One of them is your Baylor Bears. Uh, there you go. Um uh, yeah, let me say this. I actually spoke to the Baylor head coach this weekend and he was I don't know if I can say this. This is terrible. He was like, Hey, isn't it cool that like the SEC super conference got a gajillion teams in the tournament and only one is going to Oklahoma City. He said, Mm -hmm. we got three in the tournament. Talk about all three are in OKC. He's like, I would know. I had to face all three of them. It didn't go that well. It was much of the Big Ten during the basketball season. Yeah, right. But what a freaking showing. Top heavy. Sure, make the case. Whatever. But the Big 12, three teams in and the eventual national champion, too. Uh, It's That, to me, says a lot about this conference. Yep, it does. John, anything you want to add on softball before we go to football? Yeah, I just wanted to say, I, I kind of joked with Locked On SEC that part of the reason, or probably the biggest reason that uh, Oklahoma and Texas are going to Big 12 or going to the SEC is to up their softball game a little bit um, since neither none of them can get out of their super regionals. So, yeah, I mean, it's huge. You know, Jocelyn Allo, back-to-back National Player of the Year. Jordy Ball, who hasn't pitched in three weeks, was named the National Freshman of the Year uh, today. And so just, yeah, a lot of really good things going well for the Oklahoma Sooners. They got three players with more than 20 home runs on the season. The only other, only other team in the country that has multiple players was Arkansas and they gone. So they're going to get a tough test from Northwestern, have, have a really good pitcher uh, in Danielle Williams, who was a national player of the year finalist or top 10 finalist. And then they got a really good hitter too. And so it's, it's going to be a test on Thursday when they, when they match up. Texas UCLA is game one. Oklahoma plays Northwestern in game number two. And then Oklahoma State and uh, Arizona in game number four. Game three is Oregon State 
and number 14 floors. Looking forward to that. All right, quick word from our sponsors, and we'll take a football question from you all. You all sent us. Yay, football. Yay, football. Today's show is brought to you by Bet Online and BetOnline.net. If you'd like to bet on the upcoming football season, if you guys want to find the over under win totals for the Big 12 and also bet on who will be the Big 12 champion in any conference, really, their champion, you can do that at Bet Online and BetOnline.net today. Beautiful, sleek interface over there. It's free to sign up. When you guys do, check out all the odds for F1, NASCAR, MLB, NHL playoffs, NBA playoffs, and more. Once again, it's BetOnline and BetOnline.net today. All right, so we got a, fo- we got a really nice football question here. I think we're all going to like this. Um, Sam, Oklahoma State fan, asks us – oh, I assume he has. He's got an Oklahoma State icon here on YouTube. Who will be the best overall player in the Big 12 this season? Now, what we're going to do here is I'm going to go to each one of you guys, and I want to know – who from your team and, and I think the way Sam's asking this means at the end of the year, who are we going to look at and say that was the best player in the conference in 2022? So I want you guys, John and Drake, to make the case for a guy on each one of your teams. Then Jake, I'm going to ask you, who do you think is BYU's best overall player? And then we'll all give our thoughts about who is going to be the best overall player in the conference. So who want John? Do you have a player that you think will be best over that has a chance to be the best overall player in the conference? On and overall is very, very tough. Yeah, that's term. really tough. I mean, right? So, do you have anybody in mind? I mean, I think from, Dylan Gabriel from do Oklahoma it, so. specifically. Yeah, I mean, you could make a case for Dylan Gabriel or Marvin Mims. You know, being in that conversation, I think um, on the defensive side, Marcus Stripling, I think, is a guy that's going to have a really, really strong season for the Sooners. Uh, had a breakout game against Oregon, showed up real well in the spring game. He's a guy that's you know, trying to replace Isaiah Thomas or Nick Bonito off the edge. And he's kind of been biding his time. You know, There's Ronnie Perkins, and then there was Nick Bonito and Isaiah Thomas. And now this is a guy that he's ready to roll. And I think he could be somebody that really stands out for the Oklahoma Sooners. But, yeah, I, I think a lot of times we will look at the, the offense, and it's going to be Dylan Gabriel. There's no real reason to expect that he's going to have a down year. All he's done is produce. He's averaged 300 yards passing per game. He's thrown for 70 touchdowns, very few interceptions. And so I, I would, I, I think of Oklahoma Sooners, he's probably the guy that has the best chance to win like a Big 12 Player of the Year award. Uh, but I wouldn't put it past Marcus Stripling or Marvin Mims either. Drake, I think I know we're going to go with this one. Uh, are we heading on the defensive area of the football? Yeah, I mean, if you're going for Baylor, uh, <clears throat> you know, even though Blake Shapin's the best quarterback in the Big 12, uh, you know, <laughs> per me on a podcast like a month and a half ago, it, for the people, if you don't well, know, that was Gary you know, was number yeah. two. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so I right now, I think uh, definitely Siaki Ika. I really believe Siaki Ika, who took a step up late in the season last year on the defense, defensive side of the ball for Baylor, is going to end up being the defensive player of the year in the Big 12. Uh, I think he showed that trajectory toward the end. He's just, he's, an SEC caliber defensive lineman, which is there are a dime a dozen anywhere outside of the SEC. He's an LSU guy who came to Baylor and was just wreaking havoc on teams toward the end of the year last year. And a key reason why Baylor beat Ole Miss in the Sugar Bowl as well. So I think Siaki Ika is going to be that guy for the Baylor defense. And then across the Big 12 as well, a part of a D-line that is elite with Jackson Player coming in from Tulsa as well. So Baylor's not going to make its bed on the offensive side of the ball. They didn't last year and still won the league. So they're going to rely on guys like Siaki Ika in the front line, especially with the secondary having so many question marks. Give me Siaki Ika as Baylor's best shot as the, the Big 12 player of the year. Yeah, I mean, you you know, you're so right about this. This kid is 6'4", he's 350, and he he put it on late in the season. He was really strong to end that end the year for Baylor and you don't see too many guys that size. Jake, who is the best all-around player on BYU and do you think that if BYU were in the Big 12 this year, said player would have a chance to be the best overall player in the conference when it's all said and done? Real quick, let me just interject on Siaki Ika. I've called his high school games. He played here in Salt Lake City wow. in Utah Ooh. in high school at East High. And when he went to LSU, he's actually a big BYU fan. Funny enough, he, yep. if you ever pay attention to his Twitter feed, he actually talks a lot about the Cougars. But he is a he is a really, really fun player. And he's Baylor got lucky to get that kid. He's a fantastic human being. Let me just add that in there. All right. Um, on the BYU front, I, I think it's Jaron Hall. Jaron Hall is the everything that he's kind of the next. Zach Wilson type guy. We just saw the uh, big board rankings come out from Mel Kuyper. He starts at number six on that list. I have heard plenty of hype for him going into this season. That all expectations are if he has a healthy year, he's off to the NFL despite having another year of eligibility potentially beyond this year. 
Uh, I think that his ability to both run and pass makes BYU's offense that much more dangerous. The only other guy I would mention in terms of BYU is Blake Freeland, but offensive linemen don't get the love. <laughs> so I, I guess I would go with Jaron Hall. And I think that Jaron, if he were to go out and have the season, I think he envisions he could be capable of having this year. He would be in the mix, for maybe one of the top five players in the Big 12 if the Cougars were in the conference. But he'd have to go out there and prove that because the biggest thing that he has not proven so far is his durability. He has missed multiple games every season. He's played for BYU in his career so far. If he can have a healthy senior, it would be a redshirt junior season, he would, I think, be a guy absolutely in the mix. So I want to now shuttle us over to the conversation about – and look, I think it's a great pick. You know, with Jaron Hall, I think in, in, in the Big 12 he'd have a shot too because we feel like it's pretty wide open. I'm going to shuttle us over to the who we think it's going to be. I'm, this is going to be the safest possible pick, but I think I have to go here. Deuce Vaughn is the best mm. all-around player heading into 2022. He is, he, is he the talent that B. John Robinson is? No, he is not, right? I think we can all admit that. But when, you, when I watched him last year with the revolving door of quarterbacks, whether it was uh, – who graduated this year? The kid was there forever. Totally blanking on his name. Somebody Skyler else. Thompson. Skyler Thompson. Whether it was Will Howard, whether it was Jaron Lewis playing quarterback for them, he was, he was money. He was really good. And that's hard to do when, especially a guy who makes, you know, you get some of that bread coming out of the backfield catching footballs as well. Um, the guy's a true four down back. And you don't see many guys who are 5'6", 172 that are true four down backs. 1,800 yards total on the year last year. 22 total touchdowns. He's basically around like, I think it's like six plus yards uh, per touch. Uh, he's well over six yards per touch last year. So, I think that is my leader right now. While he might not win player of the year, or offensive player of the year, like he's just the best player in the conference, I think, in my opinion. Talent? No. But like scalability plus already seen production, he's a really talented player. I mean, don't get me wrong. Bijan's just like, it's like, wow, I think of Adrian Peterson. I think of B. John Robinson, like mm -hmm. next level talent guys. But like, yeah, he's really talented. And also he's already really good. So I'm going to go that direction. John, what do you think? I mean, he was kind of one of the first guys that came to my mind when having this discussion, but I'll throw another name at you, and that's Xavier Worthy. I don't think Oklahoma fans want to hear this necessarily, but the dude is legit, and he's really, really good. I mean, we saw it on the first play of the game last year in the Red River Showdown. The guy can score from anywhere on the field, made one of our transfer quarterbacks, Latrell McCutcheon, end up standing on his head uh, with his uh, elite ability uh, to, to score touchdowns. So. That's a guy I think is going to have another big year uh, and probably an even better year than he had last year, even though they had an, uh, several additions at the wide receiver position, uh, added a good tight end as well. So that's going to take a lot of attention in coverage away from Xavier Worthy, who should thrive because of it. you got a better quarterback. We think, we assume Quinn Ewers is going to be a better passer than either guy that they rolled out there last year. And so I think he's a guy that's going to be – in line for, for a big, big season. Another Kansas State guy I want to throw out there is Felix Anudike. That guy, man, I think he's he's going to have another big season. Um, he's already being considered as a first-round talent for the NFL draft next year, and there's a lot of reasons why. The guy can just get after the passer. He can stop the run. And he for Kansas State to be as good as people think they're going to be, he's going to have to have a big season, and I think he's fully capable of that. Drake, what are your thoughts on what John said, and also who are, who's your guy you have in mind? Yeah, I think Bijan Robinson obviously would be the the pretty low hanging fruit pick, but he only played ten games last season. In those ten games, I mean, really statistically, was still overshadowed by guys like a like a you know Abram Smith who kind of came off the page out of nowhere. Not to say that that's any knock to Bijan Robinson whatsoever, but can he stay healthy is a question for me going into this season, and can he produce consistently? I'm not sure if the answer to both of those is yes, um, especially coming off of injury. So we'll see that, and with that to throw some in there. I was going to say Deuce Vaughn. I think Deuce Vaughn's a really, really safe pick out of Kansas State. He's one of those guys that <clears throat> reminds me a lot of like Brees Hall in that he's just kind of there, right? You're just confident in his ability week after week. Xavier Worthy was like my backup too. So John, you also check that off. I'm going to throw somebody kind of random out there, but that I think could end up having a really good year this next season. I really think Sir Roderick Thompson will be leaned on out of Texas Tech, uh, especially with Joey McGuire. I think Joey McGuire is going to go in there and try to to ignite something, right? Baylor-esque from what we saw from the Bears last season, which is igniting the run game when you have three quarterbacks in a carousel that I don't think is very good. I know Emery would definitely disagree with that. I, I, don't I disagree. Think that I think they're all really good. 
I see if, if there's not a lot of separation, it feels like between the three, and I'm not sure that any of the three are elite style quarterbacks. So I think you then lean on your running back because what did we see with last year with Baylor, no elite quarterback, just hand it off to somebody. So Roger Thompson might be that guy at Texas Tech. I, I will say this. So, you know, I took a lot of flack uh, recently because I, I had their running back group ranked like, I think I put him six, which in retrospect was too low. I think they should have been like around fifth or fourth. Here's the thing, though. I looked last year at some of the numbers that Zach Kitley, excuse me, that his running backs put up. They're not particularly good. Now, I yeah. think to Drake, I think Drake, the one thing that is going to benefit them is that I'm not really positive who's going to be catching the football for Texas Tech this year. Mm. So I think with that, it's like, all right, who do we have? We have Sir Roderick Thompson, we have Taj Brooks. We have uh, Xavier White, who I think is be transitioning to wide receiver now for playing running back. So I think actually, like that might be the thing. Is like, all right, we might just have to get the running backs football a whole lot. So I think Sir Roderick Thompson might have a really good year. Uh, yeah. Jay, hey, hate Sir Roderick Thompson as you might. You guys also took Bijan Robinson, Deuce Vaughn, and Xavier Worthy off the board. So what? what you, you, can, you can pick whoever you want. This is Quentin like, Johnston. You know, there's, there's Quentin <laughs> Johnston. Right here. Quentin, Quentin, Quentin Johnston is very much alive. Yeah. Jay, who do you have? So I was going to mention Felix Anadike, so I'm, I'm glad that name came up. I'm going to toss another defensive player out there, though, Will McDonald from Iowa State. Uh, oh, that was good. 20, is it 22 sacks, I think, over the past two years uh, for yeah. Iowa State? He is a kind of a hybrid linebacker slash defensive end type, but I'm not going to lie. I'm going to uh, – Drake, I'm going to – put Siaka Ika up there. His ability to both rush the passer, being 350 pounds, but also just be that man in the middle who just clogs everything up. He's a monster. So there's a lot of talent spread around this conference, both on the offense and defensive side of the ball. And I, I, I'm not sure there's a there's a clear favorite, but maybe maybe Deuce Vaughn is the guy because I he just his overall production numbers. Yeah, so I, I think because remember last year, didn't he have the was the five and a half six sack game where they took a sack away because it got yeah. that was so dumb because the ball got stripped away. Um, yeah, look on on defense, I think we have to go to, go, go to those those are the big three, right? Think about Ika. Think about uh, I always mispronounce it. Was was Arike? Is that is, is that right? Was Arike? I, fair enough. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Anu DK. Whatever. Yeah. Anu DK. Yeah. I, I always mess it up, whatever. Uh, and then also Will McDonald, right? And he mm-hmm. came back. And I think, I mean, look, when he and Hutchinson decided to come back, I was really surprised. I think the other one, John mentioned Quentin Johnson, especially in offense. So this is a guy that um, on draft boards, you'll actually see he's a pretty highly rated, rated wide receiver just because you look at him, the physical tools that he has are off the charts. The problem for him was, you don't really get to see him run the tree, especially when they uh, with their offense last year. Um, it was kind of like, all right, uh, it, it just bombs. Like he had the kind of games where it's like three catches, 160 yards, and two touchdowns. You're like, yeah. oh, okay, I guess that's how it is. And that wasn't really his fault. I- I'm excited to see that offense this year, maybe with Chandler Morris, uh, if things change there. Anybody else that we anybody think that we're missing? Nobody sure said people... Devin Neal. Nobody has said the Texas world beater so, Devin Neal. So, so. Now, if you watch the running back ranking show, we Rob, my friend Robbie Triano five from Serious XM, we had we had Kansas's running backs mm. ranked number two in the league in our power rankings because they're also bringing over Kai Thomas from yeah. Minnesota, who had a spectacular year. So, look, you know, mention that. I mean, the, the running back in this league, it's really curious, guys. We have this conversation a whole. I think we've mentioned this before, but like, we're going to be talking about hey. Do the quarterbacks take the step up to kind of fill the hole that wide receiver or the running backs left last year, or is it the other way around? And BYU is no different, right, Jake? I mean, no yeah. Tyler Algier, so it's going to have to be Jaron Hall. Yeah, well, and the, the one other name I felt like we probably need to throw out there is one of John's guys, Marvin Mims. I, I know that he yeah. doesn't have the monster numbers quite yet, but sure feels like he is ready to break out. And uh, that's probably the one other guy I would probably have on that list is Marvin Mims. Uh, I'm with you on that. We should definitely have him on there. But if, if, if we had to pick, so let's all, let's all pick a person. So I'm picking Deuce Vaughn. That's my guy. Drake, who's your guy? Uh, if you're going to take Deuce Vaughn off the board, you, can take who <sighs> you, you know do, what? You can still have him too. John, have John, him. John, do you have dibs on Xavier Worthy? No, what? you can have him. You can, you oh, can oh. have the same player. All right. All right. All right. Fine. Oh, I felt so like we have the same player. It. Shoot, man. All right. You know what? I'm give me Fine. I can't go with the Texas guy. Give me Deuce Vaughn. I'm gonna go with Josh here. It's a safe there pick. If I had to if I had to put money, if I had to bet online one player, it is Deuce Vaughn. <laughs> John. 
Yeah, I'm going to turn the corner and go Dylan Gabriel. I just think mm-hmm. the offense is just ready to explode. Marvin Mims, you know, Jake mentioned Marvin Mims. He's averaged 20 yards per reception for his career at this point in time. And now he's got a, an offense that's probably going to feed him a little bit more heavily. There's going to be less of a wide receiver rotation like they had last year. And so I think I think Dylan Gabriel is just really set to to have a really strong season. A lot of it's going to come down to the the three games that matter the most for Oklahoma on their schedule, and that's Baylor, Oklahoma State, and Texas. And how he performs in those games is going to go a long way to determining where Oklahoma stands in the Big 12 and his status as potentially player of the year. Jake. I'm going with my boy Siaki Ika. His nickname is Apu. It's we, the nickname he grew up with. I, I love the kid. I've known him for years. I'm, I think he is going to be an absolute stud this year for Baylor in the middle of that defense. Mm. Hey, Josh, Alrighty. I'll throw this out here too. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. Nobody has mentioned the Big 12 Offensive Lineman of the Year, who is back next season, Connor Galvin. Oh. Uh. Yeah, that guy deserved. Also, I'll say this: number one, that guy deserves a shout out. Two, you notice how in the in the in the first conversation about best player in Big Twelve, right? We didn't really mention a quarterback. Does that show just Dylan how Dylan Gabriel good, was there? To be fair, Dylan Gr- Gabriel was there. We also have an Oklahoma guy on here, John. Hey, uh, just, Dylan I, Gabriel. I think Josh brought him up. I'm just I, uh, I, I was, I was the first person to bring him up. Oh my gosh! I was wow, the first person to bring him up, but John did take as it as he end, should so. be. As he should be. Most years, though, it'd be like you're throwing out Jalen Hurts, right? Well, or let's just say, even, I mean, come on, Jeff Lebby just got. I mean, he had Matt Corral mm-hmm. on his way to being a first round NFL. I never saw Matt Corral play well. I'm sorry, John. I never saw Matt Corral. What play games well. were you watching? Like, oh, only you know, one of them, and I was he there. Got knocked out. He didn't play the whole game. I think. I think to Drake's point, like, yeah, like. Well, it's so funny because we expect the quarterbacks to take a step up yeah. this year, but we just mentioned a bunch of running backs and wide receivers. Well, is that <laughs> does that show the parity at the top of the Big 12 quarterback battle, or does it yes. show oh, truly yeah. how well the skill position guys are in this conference, or well, does it say a little bit of both? The first the first team Big 12 quarterback last year wasn't brought up, right? And I mean, Because he wasn't like, good. Like, once again, I have a lot of real estate on Spencer Sanders Island. Uh, you know, it's somebody who's who might have to sell it off this year trying Waste to have money. You know, Trying to hang on to it as, as long as possible. Um, one more thing I want to mention before we get out of here, guys, uh, on this is uh, not this conversation specifically. Um, something somebody mentioned to us that, like, so I, I told y'all last week, the San Diego State folks have really just been pushing their agenda on me. Um, I think I just automatically say no to a time zone that spans four, uh, excuse me, a conference that spans four time zones. Yeah. Like, That's- I'm cool with Mountain Time. I'm cool with Mountain Central and East Coast Time. I'm cool with that. I don't. I don't want to be playing in Orlando, Florida, and San Diego. Like, I, God love you all. Have been excellent to me. You, I, I really appreciate the interaction on Twitter. But and somebody else had mentioned this too. Like, we don't want a four time zone league, Jake. Right? Uh, you're yeah. You're gonna be spanning coast, and that's that's the tough part. Is in terms of the travel that would be involved with all that. San Diego State, their fan base is they they want so badly to be. At the power five level. So I get why they're pushing this. The problem is the Pac-12 is never going to take them. And so the only option they have is to push for the Big 12 as hard as they possibly can. The sad part is if you were to go to the pecking order of potential expansion candidates, what? Memphis, Boise State, Colorado State, Air Force. You keep going down that SMU. list. SMU. SMU. Yeah, yeah. You, you go down that list of ways before you finally get to San Diego State as a viable option. So it just doesn't seem like they're – they're going to be the the darling that they think they are. Wow. Jake just made every program. San Diego State fan so upset right there. That was a little hey, Jake bomb right hey, there on San Diego hey, State. BYU and San Diego State. Like, it's a solid program. Like, if they were anywhere else, it uh-huh. would make some sense. Like, if they were right. in New Mexico, like, it would make a little bit of sense. But they're so far out there. And I love San it's Diego. It's a good, successful it's program. And also, I balk at adding them because there's so much stuff you can do in San Diego. Hey, right, there's got, so there's a much zoo. stuff you can do. They have the zoo. Just, well, how about the beach? I'd recommend the beach. You know, yeah. that's why it's, it's like, like oh, okay. I mean, if, if, you ever, if, you ever watch, if you ever watch Chargers games, the, the Chargers played 17 road. My dog, my dog agrees. That's the dog. Chargers played 17 road games every or every single year. 16, 16, now 17. Because you know why? There aren't any. There, there are no Chargers fans. And look. I know there are some people who love their San Diego stuff. And look, there are some people with Chargers. Hey, like, hey, Josh, I work day to day with a diehard Chargers fan. He is. There the- are some of them out there, but like when they first moved to LA, when yeah. they played, Jake, Jake knows the one. Jake knows the one guy. Yeah. yeah. People are like, you know what I want to do? I'm going to go out to Los Angeles and go out to San Diego and go watch him play. And, and like, 
And Qualcomm sucked. So uh, that's... You're, you're not wrong. And the thing is, the, the show, which is their fan section, they have a very vibrant Twitter community. Uh, I guarantee I'm going to have San Diego State fans in the show coming after me in my Twitter mentions. I'm totally okay with that. I've got a long history of a decade plus with those folks. Uh, I work with David James on a day-to-day -day basis. He is the diest of the diehard Chargers fans, but he gave up on them when they moved to L.A. He's a San Diego native. I work with him on a daily basis. And as soon as they moved to L.A., they essentially were dead to him. So there wow. you go. It, it makes sense. And here's the thing too, like, so I, I thought it would be more possible right now if, if we're going to do this expansion thing, the PAC 12 does not have their new deal yet. Mm -hmm. I would, I would shoot for an Arizona or an Arizona state or a Colorado, maybe to get them. And I know they probably wouldn't because they already made the jump. But like I would go with that direction too. One, and I know that we pushing it West coast, but that's the only way I would do it is one of those schools. It's kind of already a brand that like, Arizona is, you know, is right there, right? It, it's, it's, this yeah. not like it's, it's too far away to go. It kind of makes sense, not too far from Texas. So I think that's the direction I would go. But I mean, I, San Diego State's a bridge too far for me. That's, that's a bridge too far. And I know it's close to Arizona and it's that far away. But like, unless you give me a Power Five program, it's not the, the action's not really worth, worth the juice, uh, you know, to, to use a phrase in the movie Heat. So, yeah, I, or, you know, to, to change around, I guess. Um, anybody, anything else on expansion before we get out of here? I just say, give me all, give me the Arizona schools. If you can get the Arizona schools, I'm all for it. There's been those yeah. rumors out there. Chase them as hard as you possibly 